My fellow sheep, election season is upon us. Are you one of the 12% of Americans who still approves of our government? Then we need your help to force the other 88% into compliance. Our democracy depends on it. We're an organization called Citizens Against Too Much Unfettered Freedom, or CATMUF. CATMUF is a bipartisan flock of sheep whose goal is expanding government until nothing else remains. Because the government is here to help you. How can you help CATMUF help you? By only voting for candidates dedicated to expanding government. It's easy. You don't need to study the issues. No matter what a politician says when running for office, they're all dedicated to expanding government. And make sure you tell all your friends and family to vote for more government. Here at CATMUF, we don't care if you vote Democrat or Republican, as long as you vote for candidates committed to growing our federal family. CATMUF. Because folks just aren't smart enough to handle real freedom. Yeah, the, the best is when you... I made one, and like a year later, it just started... I, every time I opened up Facebook, it was on a different page. And it was on like a libertarian page. It was on an anarchist page. It made it to a conservative page. I saw it on a threeper page. I'm like, I made this a year ago sitting on the toilet. <laughs> but, I mean, it's like, really, guys? Now? Yeah, I'll take it. We are just some modern day abolitionists looking to rid the world of the last vestige of slavery. Statism. It's the Seeds of Liberty podcast with Andre, Dave, and Jeremy. and welcome to the 146th episode of the Seeds of Liberty podcast. As always, we are covered by a Bipcot no government license. This allows reuse by anyone except governments and the agents thereof. You can find out more information about this at bipcot.org. So we're back. Well, I'm back. It's Jeremy. And we have a special episode this week. Uh, the other boys couldn't make it. And uh, I do need to clear something up about last week's episode. I added something in there and tried to cover for Andre and, you know, said he obviously had a good reason for missing the show. Unfortunately, I found out after I put that uh, edit together and sent it off uh, that he actually just got drunk with his girlfriend and forgot about us. So he needs to be shamed. So boo you, Andre. Um, but anyway, uh, this week, like I said, we have a special show because we actually have a special guest that was uh, we could only work out to do at a time other than we normally record. So that's why I'm here. But I am joined today by Mance Rader of the Free Man Beyond the Wall podcast and also the author of Freedom Through uh, Freedom Through Meandom. There we go. I could say that. <laughs> hey, Mance, thanks for joining me tonight. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Oh, you're quite welcome. Uh, I uh, I reached out to you uh, fairly recently. Uh, I mentioned I, I I had heard your name bandied about, and at first it took me a while to actually uh, get a beat on it because I'm like, I know that name. I know that name from somewhere. And uh, <laughs> uh, I read the Great Game of Thrones books years ago, but I never actually watched the series, so it took me a while to figure that out, <laughs> that uh, you picked up that pseudonym. But then when I found your podcast, I'm like, ah, that makes sense. Um, but I heard about you, uh, where I get most of my news, sadly, from the Tom Wood show, because I try to avoid the news like the plague. And uh, when I hear about things come up on his show, and I heard you interviewed there, and since then, I've heard you interviewed in a couple other places. I, I subscribed to your podcast, started listening, uh, took a look at your book, and thought you were a very interesting guy. So I wanted to get a chance to talk to you. So, Well, I appreciate it, man. Ask anything. Uh, if Anyone who knows me from social media, my podcast, any appearances I've done, and especially if you've read my book, you know that I'm not I'm not the kind of person who holds stuff back. So, um, you know, the converse. I love conversations, so ask well, anything. That's great. Well, that's uh, we're gonna like I said, we I, we're gonna run this show since it's just you and I. We're gonna run it more like I run my uh, my other podcast, Abolition Subtractions, which is pretty much just having conversations. So that'll work, work out perfectly. Uh, well, the first thing I the first thing I did want to ask you, which I, I noticed, uh, I, I, this was a fact I only picked up recently. I guess I don't know how this managed to escape me, but <laughs> you, I, I guess you grew up in uh, what I what I, I like to refer to as the DPR and Y. As I did uh, in 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 the uh, 
Democratic People's Republic of New Yorkistan. Um, although you you grew up in the city, right? Which yeah. I, I I never had yeah. to venture that far. Luckily, <laughs> um, I don't know. I I I don't find too many people. Well, at least I, I mean I found a few. But like when I get a chance to talk to other you know New Yorkers or former New Yorkers, uh, I'm always curious as to how that's shaped your long term view on things. Because I I always figured that me be, being from here made me very cynical to begin with. But somehow the whole government thing escaped me for a very long time. Yeah, uh, it, it's just. I mean, I love New York. I I go back. I try to go back two or three times a year, spend a couple of days, at least three days, you know, hit some of my favorite restaurants that I've been going to for a very long time. There's a restaurant I love to go to that my family's actually been going to since, you know, the year they opened. And that was back in the 70s. Um, I mean, there's... I love going. I love. I still love the Yankees. So whenever I go up and the Yankees are playing, I go to a game. I still have friends that I went to high school with up there that I meet up with whenever I go up there. Even if we, you know, all, even if like you know the click of twelve to fifteen can't get together, a couple of us will get together. Um, I mean, I, I love the city. I just, I'd never live there again. I mean, it's just, it's, it's an absolute. And I have a bio that I that I that I made up, and you know, the first sentence in the bio says that i you know i grew up in the government controlled hell hole that is new york city <laughs> and that's basically what it is i mean i went when i went up for a uh, high school reunion the there were the second time we tried to do a reunion there was 14 of us that showed up like i said it wasn't gonna be the whole high school it was just gonna be like really our little crew and yeah. there was only two of us that didn't work for the government Wow. If you, if you live in New York City, you know, for the most part, if you're not, you know, if you're not working on Wall Street, if you're not trading, if you're not in tech, you you most likely have a government job. And I, like I said, there was 14 of us and, and 12, 12 of the people. It was me and one other guy who didn't work for the, you know, who worked for private, you know, worked for corporations. Um, but everybody else was a, a government employee. And that's what I think of New York City now. I think if I was going to live in New York City, I'd probably have to have I'd probably have to get a government job because <laughs> they're just, um, you know, or, you know, maybe one day uh, be one of those people that goes on Fox News and just makes fun of everybody or, you know. <laughs> oh, there you go. Like a la Dave Smith. I think that's what he's doing. Well, they, now, I think they kicked him off Fox News. Now, now he's only allowed on Kennedy show, I think. <laughs> well, well, no, he um, he actually signed a contract with cnn oh that's right that's what he did so he's not allowed to that's right Um, so he got well he well he he still gets a lot of he still gets a lot of digs in there and uh you know one of his clips where he just absolutely destroyed foreign uh u.s foreign policy in 90 seconds actually went real went viral hard i mean i think uh uh, i forget what the hell that uh that finance one of the finance pages picked it up and and retweeted it and it was just it went everywhere but um yeah so he he gets to get some digs in you know so oh yeah and oh yeah if if, in case i'm burying the lead for anybody who doesn't know we're referring to uh i I think he refers to himself as the libertarian dave smith because you know dave smith's a very common a common name but the uh, uh, very (laughs) very popular libertarian comedian who also has his own podcast part of the problem and does a bunch of other stuff but yeah he he's brilliant at that uh, him, him, like, uh, who's the other one? Uh, Michael Malice, like those guys have kind of mastered that art of being able to distill the message they want to get down into these very tiny clips. Because as if you listen to Dave's show, he talks about it all the time. He doesn't have a choice. You have, you, you literally have like anywhere between 30 to 90 seconds, depending on where you are in the show. And if you're coming up against a commercial break or whatever to get your point across. And especially when you're somebody who has any type of message like the one like you or I or Dave or, or Michael would try to promote, uh, they're going to cut you off even quicker. <laughs> so you yeah. got to be able to rapid fire. Like, I don't think I could ever do that. I'm, I, I still write everything long form. Like I'm horrible when it comes <laughs> to that. Like I, I taking shorthand notes has been a real chore for me, especially in the podcasting world to get used to that. But I, I just, I, I speak the way I write and it's very, long complicated sentences you know whatever that's just me so i don't know if i could ever do that but i, I give props to anybody who could who could pull that type of stuff off because it's needed you know i mean unfortunately this it's the world we live in 
and you know where people 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 with a freedom bent are kind of surrounded by more than a heck of a lot of people that don't have a freedom bent so you know if, if anybody can out there can get out there into the mainstream and have any type of voice you know i, I give them mad props for that because like i said i, I think it's sorely needed because you know we're, we're so outgunned as far as people as far as numbers go well i think i think the most important thing is if you're going to do that if you're going to have you know i mean i go on if somebody asks me to go on a podcast, I will, you know, like you said, I've been on Tom Woods. I've been on Dave Smith's part of the problem. I've been on, uh, you know, Mark Claire Lions of Liberty, but I will, I do not care. You know, I, I you never know who's listening. You never know whose life you're going to change. I mean, you could influence the next Ron Paul, you could influence the next, uh, Dave Smith, you know, and it's, you know, it's just important to get out there and talk. It's important to, you know, that's why I try to put out as many podcasts as I can. It's uh, it's difficult, you know, sometimes. And I've really been trying to concentrate on interviews and get really good guests on, uh, you know, with, you know, and I've been trying, I've been able to handle some controversial subjects within the last month on my podcast that I think people, I, I honestly believe that even though they're controversial subjects and some of it might even people might say they borderline on conspiracy theories, but the people who were talking about them, um, you know, are educated people, are people who are respected, are people who've written books, are people who are published, are award-winning journalists. And I want people to I, I want people to hear a different story. You know, my you know, yesterday I recorded a podcast and Scott Horton came on. And it's the third time I've had him on my podcast. He wrote the foreword for my book. And we talked about, he talked about all of the things surrounding the Oklahoma City bombing that most people don't know. That, you know, it wasn't a militia. They were Nazis. Um, it was that there were, it wasn't Terry Nichols and, and, um, and Timothy McVeigh alone. They were. They had a whole compound of people. It was. It was it's called Elohim City, and they. I mean, they pulled this off. You know, with you and the, the even. There is even evidence that I mean, and strong evidence it, it that you know is almost undeniable at this point that there was a Fed inside, just like there always is, that was working with them. You know, who, who actually turned out to be a German officer that they used to, you know. They used a German officer to infiltrate Nazis. And, you know, so things like that. I just did an episode with Jeremy Hammond, who's an award-winning journalist. And we did one episode on the on the real history of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, which is my most downloaded podcast by far. I mean, people are listening to it three, four, five times because it's two hours and five minutes long. And then he came on and talked about all the vaccine research he's been doing. And are vaccines really dangerous? So, you know, I think, I think we have to, we, I think it's smart to hit a lot of subjects that other people aren't hitting, but you have to do it in, you know, you, you can't do it in a way where you're just like, oh, you know, the, we believe this happened. We believe that happened. No, no, th these facts are here. You can go and we'll tell you where to look so that you can see that, you know, there was somebody in there was somebody in the truck with Timothy McVeigh. There's you know, and it wasn't a Middle Eastern man as a lot of people reported. So you know, I'm, and that's what I try to that's what I've been trying to do with my podcast. And uh, I, I think it's going to get to the point where podcasts are going to podcasts are going to become replacement for the for the mainstream media. And I think a lot of that's already I think a lot of that's already happening. So yeah, you know, we do you know we do what we can. And, you know, we just have to do it well. I mean, we have to do it really well. We have to do it better than anyone else, especially if we're going to talk about the subjects that we talk about, freedom, liberty, anarchy, um, stateless societies. You know, we, 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 we can't sound like complete lunatics. Um, we, need to, we need to make a lot of sense. Yeah, I, I agree, and uh, there's there's a lot to unpack on the, in there what you just Damn said, it. but there, yeah, there's a there's a couple of things that oh, 
I'm sorry, I was still muted on your end. <laughs> I was still recording. Like everybody could hear me, but I, I hit the mute button. Sorry about that, Mance. Uh, yeah. uh, I was I was gonna say I, I agree I agree with you and the uh which we'll go. There's a lot to unpack on what you just said there. Uh, cause first of all, when you started mentioning, you know, the, the different topics and, and covering things, you know, that could be considered conspiracy, whatever, it was funny. Cause as you were talking about the first one that came to mind was the one with Jeremy Hammond, because like I said, I just started, I just found your podcast recently and I, I've been trying to catch up and listen to a bunch of them. So I actually just listened to that one yesterday. And that was the first one I thought of the one that, the one that you actually mentioned first, the one with Scott Horton, I listened to today, but that didn't click with me as when you said conspiracy because to me I'm just like oh yeah he's got the facts of the case like that's actually what happens <laughs> like that's not even like I didn't even like in my mind that's like you know as, as close to settled science as you could get so I didn't even I didn't even think about that one but both of those both of those shows were great number one uh I does the thing with Oklahoma City and, and Scott Horton I have had I've heard him talk about that before but I I mean I could listen to him all all day long you know I've I power listened through like days worth of his podcast <laughs> at a time because he was another one I found late and I, I went back through and listened to a bunch of stuff, but it was, it, it was, you know, I, I think like, like I said, you're, you're definitely right. These type of things don't get out there. And if they do, they're usually put on in a manner of, it, it could just be perceived by anybody listening as somebody who's just batshit insane and just like throwing these theories out. But when you have somebody like Scott talking about these type of things, yeah, he's extremely researched. I mean, you talk about his his book that he just put out. I just listened to the audio book of that last week. And I mean, man, packed with information. And obviously, if you know anything about Scott Horton, you know this guy. If he's either doing the research or he knows the people who have done the research <laughs> and he has them on his show constantly, he's talking to them constantly, he's getting their information. So and and anybody could find most of the stuff but they most people don't take the time to because they just assume the story they've been fed is the correct one the other episode you were referring to the one with Jeremy Hammond on the vaccine one i actually i mean i found that super fascinating i really want to go back and listen to the other one you guys did i haven't listened to that one yet about the israel palestine conflict because that's actually going to play into a series that uh, my a friend of mine merrick van landingham who does the radical logic podcast him and i were actually going to do a series on a whole bunch of stuff like that so that'll actually probably be very helpful for us to listen to but from the whole vaccine thing i really love the way that you both like you guys couch that entire thing because it wasn't just oh yes they, you know just like any other like you guys met you mentioned it multiple times uh, i think actually use it i think for the bumper of the show actually maybe about the whole facebook thing like if you have most conversations about this take place on social media where it's just people screaming back and forth at one another and throwing links at one another but nobody's reading them nobody's paying attention to them it's just like it's an all-out war nobody's actually having a conversation but the way jeremy went about it and uh try and and presents the whole thing like he's done the research and it's not just well it's all here no it's okay this is the research i did these are the conclusions i came to now you can go look at it yourself and decide what conclusions you come to i'm not saying you have to come to the case so, so same conclusions there's a good chance you will you know i think at least that type that type of attitude and that's like what's sorely lacking i think in a lot of the discourse um, you know, whether it's in the, the freedom circles or people in those circles and activists trying to branch out and reach other people, it, it, it's really lacking because there is just that mentality of fight, fight, fight. I, I have the facts. I'm just going to throw them at you. And you're an idiot. If you don't, if you don't believe, you know, if you, if you think that I'm wrong, then you just must be an idiot. You must be reading, you know, whatever, pick your, you know, pick a side, the opposite of that, you know, you must be reading and watching nothing but that. So you can't possibly be informed. Well, yeah. I, and the reason I, I mentioned conspiracy theory in Oklahoma City is uh, if you notice in the beginning of that episode, the first thing I asked Scott was I said, OK, we're going to talk about this. But the average person, if they go to Wikipedia, what are they going to be told happened on April 19th, 1985? Because the average person, I mean, you know, a lot of people, it, a lot of people like us will have studied you know who know about jd cash and all the in, you know all the uh, investigation that, that he did all the work he did you know we'll we'll know names like um jesse trendadu and, and everything that that surrounded that but you know the average person if they stumble upon that they're 
you know, th- they'll have their world rocked if you jump right in and you're, you know, and you're just like, okay, these guys weren't militia, they were Nazis. The reason they were called militia is because Bill Clinton, you know, did a huge, w- was doing a huge crackdown on militias in the 90s. You know, he, wa- he wanted to stomp them, you know, especially after Ruby Ridge and Waco, all these militias kept, were popping up, but they weren't white supremacist militias. They were more like 3% kind of threepers. You know, they weren't white nationalists. They weren't Nazis. They were, hey, if the government can do that to those people, they can do it to us. Let's be prepared. You know, let's be prepared. Let's be prepared if it happens. You know, so, I mean, you know, it's it's like when you talk about if you say anything about Israel, how, you know, in 1947, Jews owned seven percent of the land in Palestine. Yet the next year. All the Palestinians were gone. All the Palestinians were being driven off the land. Well, how do you go from owning 7% of a territory to owning what, basically 80% in a year without, you know, without paying for land, without, you know, well, something happened. You know, so facts are facts. You know, you have to, you're going to have to deal with the facts in a certain, in a certain way. And if you throw things at people and you give them the facts and you show it to them and they still don't want to believe that's not on you, you know, that's on them cognitive, you know, Hey, I, I haven't been like this my whole life. I haven't thought like this my whole life. You know, I remember what it was like to just blindly believe what I was being told. You know, I mean, I grew up in a house where Reagan was, you know, spoken of as a God. <laughs> yeah, oh, God, so me too. <laughs> yeah so you know it's i mean i know what that um i know what cognitive dissonance is all about i, I grew up with it and it took uh shit it was it's only been a little over 10 years now that you know that they, they've broken through you know ron paul ron paul just broke right through it one one debate in 2007 and ever since then for better or for worse um you know, I've, I've become the asshole in the room. <laughs> <laughs> See, yeah, I, I get that. I mean, I, I kind of, well, if you ask a lot of people who know me, I've probably always been the asshole in the room, but I've, I became more so once I figured this out. Not, yeah. I'm even, I, I, it, I figured it out even later, well, at least it, in the timeline than you did, because, you know, 2007, I still wasn't paying attention to anything. I, I didn't start figuring this stuff out till after my kids were born in 2011, and even then it wasn't until 2012, late 2012, before I really started taking this seriously and going, crap, I should really, really be paying attention more. Um, although now I've come full circle because in a short five year span, I went from paying attention all the time, uh, trying to be a town crier about everything, and now going back to not wanting to pay attention anymore because now I, now I know how horrible it is <laughs> and I got tired of seeing it. And I just, my whole thing is, I'm more about trying to find solutions these days instead of, I mean, it's because I know it's still needed for the problems to be reported on and for more people to become aware of them. But, you know, like I was saying before about how the message is presented a lot, of, a lot of times I think it, a lot of, it falls on deaf ears a lot of times, definitely because of the dissonance and people's own confirmation biases and not wanting to examine these things. Sure. But at least from my perspective, you know, in the five years I've been doing this whole activism thing now, I guess, and really paying attention and calling myself an anarchist. I've, you know, I went through what I call the angry anarchist stage at the beginning where I just wanted to yell at everybody and kind of shake them, you know, whether physically or, or you know, or, you know, uh, what should I call it figuratively and be like, why don't you get this? Here's the information. It's right here. Just read it. You, you'll understand. And, you know, and then I, I backed off and I've, I've, you know, change my tactics and switch and switch gears since then. But I've watched a lot of other people go through it. And I think between that and the ability to get the message out there in a particular way, a lot of people run into problems passing the message along because more because of their tactics and less because of the, the dissonance uh, of people. You know, that's actually why I think the whole 
attack via the not well i i don't like to use the word attack but i guess for the sake of argument for the sake of uh, expediency here like attack through memes which is something you obviously do uh is is actually a a wonderful tactic because you don't have to get very involved like you don't actually have to try to have conversations with people there you could just put the ideas out there and plenty of people especially you know if you're if you're good at the meme making game uh or if you have a particular style you can get plenty of people to share these things without even fully understanding what the message actually is but yeah. somebody else on their timeline or their where or their, their that social media platform will then see it and go oh wait a minute and maybe they'll make the connection you know like what you were saying before you never know who's listening i mean i've taken that tactic for years i've i've stopped debating online or at least i've tried to largely uh, but I used to do it for our for the Seeds of Liberty Facebook page. I was the one person who used to carry the page over there, and I would respond to people who you know commented on our 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 our, our shows or our memes or whatever. And there was people I would go back and forth with for days. But I but and it, and in the end, I almost never convinced them of anything. But it wasn't about them. I kept them strung along for days because I knew at some point somebody else would come along and read that exchange. And be able to see who was actually trying to either ask honest questions or make rational arguments and who was just screaming and yelling and throwing out fallacies left and right and, uh, you know, and, and basically just trying to bash the bash the other person into silence. You know, and that's I've tried to I've tried to implement that in my life. I mean, my, my life up here has been hectic for the past year. My my show, my uh, followers know all about that. Um, but, uh, you know, I think. Uh, like I said, the, the meme game, which is, you know, uh, another thing I wanted to talk to you about, because obviously you, you put out the book Freedom Through Memedom. And I, I, th- I think it's a great tactic because I, I've been uh, what I call an amateur meme maker for a couple of years now. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, it definitely it, it's so easy to, like I said, either just pass a message that some people may not fully interpret or at least interpret the way you intended it, but it still gets out there or just cause a ruckus for no reason. Like when I made a couple of weeks ago about Lauren Southern, although I will, I, <laughs> I, I, I do want to ask you because I, I, I've said this because people come down on me sometimes because of the memes I make, but I've tried to explain to people and I don't think they fully get it. The overwhelming majority of memes I produce are almost always first and foremost, because they make me laugh. I'm not really thinking about other people. <laughs> I'm like, oh, if this makes me laugh, great. I'm going to make it. <laughs> we'll see if it makes other people laugh, <laughs> or if it, if it gets if people share it because it gets a message they want to get across. Um, but that's that's like my first instinct. I don't know about you. Do you make them specifically with uh, with like ideas in mind of of like a, a direction you want to go, or is it something that like catches your fancy first? Yeah, both. Okay. It it just depends. I mean. Some of the best memes I've made are just like in a, sitting in a restaurant waiting for my food, and I'm you know I make them on the phone, yeah, and just just from thoughts that come in. You know, most of the time, if I'm if I'm sitting silent, that's when I get my best uh, ideas. I meditate. Um, I, I've been meditating for ten years, and I, I get some. Yeah, and I'm not supposed to. I'm not supposed to be getting ideas and going over things in my head when I meditate, but it's just. It, it, my, my, it's the way my mind works. Um, you know, I get, I get idea. I, my best ideas are when I'm quiet, but, um, my, I mean, a lot of times I do it. Yeah. You know, most of the memes I make are to, I, I would say, I would say 70% to elicit a reaction, okay. you know, to see, you know, you know, like, you know, that Lauren Southern meme, although that Lauren Southern meme was not mine. That's uh, a friend of mine's from Facebook, um, but you know I've put out memes that I've made my you know most of the memes that I make myself that I share, you know usually I catch shit for them because <laughs> you know I'm I like to I like to stir the I like to stir the pot I like to see um, I like to see people start discussing them and see it get heated a little bit. Uh, but I've, you know, I- I'm trying to get away from this whole debate online thing as well, mostly because I, it's really hard. It- it's much easier if you're going to debate somebody to know exactly where they're coming from. And, you know, it, one thing that 
Scott Horton recommended a recommended a, a Rothbard article to me yesterday, and I started reading it. And I'm like, you know, and it's basically it's called uh, "Left and Right: The Prospects for Liberty." And he wrote this article in the '60s when he was hanging he was hanging out with Maoists, and you know, he was basically at that point he was hanging out with anybody who was you know anti war, you know, anti Vietnam War, and it really goes to show it, it 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 really opens your eyes to the fact that like people on the left the left is not monolithic at all I and mean, there's people there's people on the left that are really close to you know or really close to conservatives you know you could you know change one or two things they're conservative the um but then you know there are there are people out there calling themselves communists, but it's like, what kind of communism? There is different, you know, there's differing kinds. There's, you know, if they want to destroy the, if they want to destroy the state, um, you know, if they're more socialist and they want to destroy the state, that's actually more classic libertarian, you know, without, you know, libertarians used to, there, there was a, you know, way back, if you want to look at the earliest libertarians, they were very laissez-faire, but they were very much against the, uh, against state monopolies. And, you know, stuff like this has helped me realize that, you know, the government that we have right now is not, um, for all we want to call it socialist or it's borderline communist, actually it's a lot more fascist. It's a lot more classically fascist. Oh, I agree. <laughs> and especially even from from you know from the police state to the government to corporatism to ol to oligarchy. I mean, that's just class. That's just classic fascism. So, I, I think what I'm going to try and do when I engage people online from now on is just try and figure out where they're coming from. You know, because another thing another thing Scott said is he said. You want to argue if you're going to if you're going to argue with someone, if you're going to debate someone, you want to be able to come at them and show them how what they believe, how, how what they may be advocating for violates what they believe. You know, if you're going to if you're going to approach somebody uh, on the right about being anti-war. Well, how does that affect other things they're supposed to believe if they call themselves a conservative and a fiscal conservative, yet they're pro-war? Show them how there that those two things don't work together, you know, and you know just stuff like that. I'm I mean I'm constantly constantly trying to learn, uh, especially I mean I just finished writing my second book, and just from some of the things that I've thought about in the last 24 hours, I'm going back. You know, I'm going to go back over the book and see if maybe I maybe I need to tweak some things. You know, so. Yeah, I think it's a constant learning. I think it's a constant learning, uh, learning process. I mean, I hope it's a constant learning process because, you know, I mean, I'm reading all sorts of all sorts of literature about, you know, that, I mean, it's there's so there's so much out there that, that you you need to read if you want to be well rounded and you really want to be a good spokesman for uh, you know for what we do. Oh, absolutely, and I I think. I mean, yeah, of course, you, in order to be well, well rounded, but yeah, the the whole I, I think uh, a lot of a lot of the problem I see, unfortunately, is that far too many people don't continue that education process. I mean, education to me has always been like this lifelong thing, you know, even before I fully understood what was wrong with the public school system and stuff. Because I, I mean, I I got hit like with both uh, both barrels because not only did I go through uh, public education my entire school career well at least until I finally dropped out uh, in the 11th grade but up until then I was also raised by two public school teachers <laughs> so I had it coming at me in all directions but you know I, I think uh, even then I still I still understood education to be like this lifelong thing you you should always be learning something you know you're never done learning and I think unfortunately far too many people, kind of forget that because once they figure out that the you know that what they what they see that they agree with like you know i guess people like us who think that you know the the, the state is a problem <laughs> it's always historically been a problem we can't really get around that um once they reach that point they're just like oh now i have all the answers and <laughs> then they become 
they they kind of rever- I mean I've used the term in the past and I I'm also constantly trying to re uh, uh change my vocabulary because I know even though like you mentioned before you know kind of like to liking to inflame certain situations I'm I'm very want to do that <laughs> but I have learned that it, it turns a lot of people off and unfortunately it's it always ends up being the people that eventually I want to be able to reach and if I've turned them off in the beginning well it's going to be really hard to get them back so I'm also kindly constantly trying to evolve my language but you know, I, I think uh, too many people, like I said, I see they just they get to this point, and they stop, and they're like, "Oh, I have all the answers." Like, no, man, now you're 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 in that residual statism stage where now you've just kind of reverted back, and you're arguing the same exact way you would have before you figured out all this additional stuff. You just don't realize it, you know, because now you once again think you have all the answers. And like for myself, if I think back to when I was still a believer in, go- in the necessity of government, a status, whatever you want to call it, when when I was there, I thought I had the answers. So there was certain things that I would just argue against blindly with that, you know, thinking that I had this axiomatic position to work from, that there was no, like, anybody who was arguing against that was, well, essentially some crazy conspiracy theorist because they didn't, you know, they, they're, this, this was an axiom, you know, like for, for example, in that example, the government is necessary. Well, everybody knows that that's basically an axiom. <laughs> we, we start from there and move forward. You know, like I said, I think, I, I mean, it's, I, I like to hear that, you know, that you're, you want to take the, these different tactics too, because I, I think it's important. I think get, you know, continuing to get the message out there and trying to help. Cause uh, like I said, eventually all these people that so many people in the freedom movement, I see tune out. Because they're like, oh, I can't deal with these status. We're never going to change their minds. Well, first of all, like you said before, you know, none of mo- almost none of us were born this way. Or although I would argue we're all born this way, and they were conditioned really quickly into uh, to, to uh, believing otherwise. But most of us had to come to these ideas later in life. So it's it, it obviously can work because it worked on all of us. And unless you think that you're something special and better than, you know, however, you know, 99 point whatever percent of the world, uh, then, you know, chances are it can work on other people, too, if it worked on you. You know, you're <laughs> yeah. uh, so I, I think, yeah, we definitely got to kind of shift things in that direction. And it's your, uh, the, you know, what you were saying about what uh, Scott Horton told you. Yeah, exactly. You, you do. If you're going to talk to people, you definitely have to come at them from their perspective. And it, it is funny. You mentioned the whole communist thing and about how there is different, uh, like there's different types of communists because <laughs> I'm actually glad my other co-host Dave isn't here. I pick on him all the time because he likes, he's one of those people who likes to call everything communist. Uh, and it, you know, that he doesn't like basically. I mean, we actually had a show titled a couple of weeks ago that, you know, why do we need definitions when we have a Dave and the 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 show t- the show picture was the I made a meme of you know the Hitler book um, you know everybody I hate is Hitler except I have Dave and everybody I hate is a communist because that's how he acts but he just he puts those you know sometimes put those blanket terms out there and it's like no there there are different you know even inside like you know people that are both would will tell you they identify as communists they may actually believe wildly different things. <laughs> Uh, because most people have their own personal definitions for most words, which is another thing most people skip over. Uh, not even talking about like online debate, even just trying to have a conversation online. You know, although unfortunately most people are in that mindset, they immediately try to slip into like debate debate mode. They think everything's a debate. It's like, no, we don't have a moderator here. It's like, come on, man. Like, let's have a conversation. But if you skip over that definition phase, even in the most simple conversations, you can end up with, you know, wildly conflicting ideas and you don't understand why. And it's like, well, no, we actually are talking about the same thing, but we're, you, you know, we're using these two, these, this one term completely differently. And, you know, people, that's how a lot of people end up talking past each other. So I, I think, you know, but aside, you know, defining your terms is important, not just in a, not just in a debate, not just in an argument, uh, just in, you know, in a lot of conversations. And if you are somebody who wants to spread this message and talks about wanting to spread this message, then yeah, I, I think it definitely behooves you and the just the idea of freedom in general to try to actually reach out to people individually and not treat them as, oh, you're a communist. Well, I can just talk to you like this and throw words at you like this because you all think the same thing. Well, no, that's, that's not really how it works in reality, folks. At least not yeah. in my experience. <laughs> well, well going, going back to memes... Um, I think memes are they're they're very powerful. I mean, I I don't know how many people I know um, 
who I deal with who said that, you know, they've gone down a rabbit hole just because of something they saw in a meme. You know, and they, they're like, OK, so, OK, is this true? Let me go. Let me go investigate it. Um, you know, they, they're very powerful. I mean, they're they're basically Internet bumper stickers. And the, the great thing about them is, you know, most bumper stickers, when you're driving down the street, you can't even, you know, because of the way traffic is, you can't even see them. You can't even read most of them. And I don't want to read most of them anyway. But, um, you know, it's, you know, people, you know, if they're scrolling along on the Internet, you know, they'll they'll stop and they'll read it. You know, if there's, you know, I've, and I've posted up memes before that had, uh, you know, blatant untruth, you know, untruths. And I immediately try and take them down. Um, but, you know, before I post something up, especially if it has some, if, if there's a claim in it, uh, I try to, I try to fact check it before I throw it up there. But um, I think they're, you know, and it's one of the reasons I wrote the book. It, one of the reasons I wrote the book in the, the manner that I wrote it in is I just don't, I don't want to say that people aren't, people aren't smart enough anymore to, you know, to sit down and read a book. Um, you know, what chapters and pages and, you know, even something like anatomy of the state, which is what 60, 65 pages long. Um, but by the, you know, by, by putting my, by adding memes to my commentary, you know, to my teachings, I, you know, I think it, it attracts people and, you know, they can read. I, I try to do it where even with the new book, the new book has memes in it. And I, I just basically use a meme as as um, to enhance the commentary th that I'm making. So, yeah, I, I I think they are powerful. I don't think they won an election for Donald Trump, like a lot of people will say. <laughs> but um, you know, I I think they can definitely be. Uh, I think they can definitely be teaching tools, and yeah, that's that's not hyper, that's not hyperbolic either. I I, I really believe that there 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 are some really great memes out there and um i've i'm i'm pretty proud of some uh, of some of the ones that i've that i've made that you know the, the best is when you i made one and like a year later it just started I, every time i opened up facebook it was on a different page and it was on like a libertarian page it was on an anarchist page it made it to conservative page i saw it on a threeper page i'm like I made this a year ago, sitting on the toilet. <laughs> but, I mean, it's like, really, guys? Now, eh, I'll take it. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, it's it's funny because I, I mean, I, I've had I've had some of those experiences too, and it it is, you know, you you started to mention that earlier about when you were saying, you know, what where you know, kind of where you get the ideas for them or whatnot, and what what you know, what kind of work you put into them, and the response you get because I've noticed that too. Like some of my biggest ones are the are the ones that, that exactly I made literally just as I was walking somewhere, or I'm actually famous for. Uh, cause I make all my memes on my phone. Uh, once, once I discovered Pixar and, F and Fonto, I was like, all right, I'm done. <laughs> I'm, I'm just going to work with these two things and I can make pretty much anything I want to do with these two. This is great. And I've actually mastered the art of making memes while driving. So some of my memes I've literally made in between like traffic lights, you know, mm -hmm. up here on Long Island where I stop at a light, I quickly bang out a bunch of it. I go to the next light, I finish it off and I'm like, and you know, by the third, by the third light in the, in the string, I'm ready to, to post it. You know, and it's those ones that have ended up taking off. Um, although I am there, there are, you know, there's, you know, I, there's a bunch of them that I make cause some people think memes are just ridiculous, but I, I, I mean, I don't think it's just my bias. Like you said, you know, you don't think it's hyperbolic. I don't think it's either. And I, I don't think it is either rather. And I don't think it's just my bias cause I do make them, <laughs> but in saying that not only do they, are they able to convey a message and do it in a, the, you know, the whole bumper sticker thing, I mean, it, it, it works because that's the, the the day and age we're in right now. I, I refer to, to it often as the meme and Twitter, the Twitter generation. And I don't necessarily mean the generation of like people not like the millennials or whatever. I just mean like the everybody now in the computer age, like that's really the point we've reached where the overwhelming majority of people have such a short attention span partially i believe you know i believe to talk about you know conspiracies want to put on my tinfoil hat a, a little bit uh and i've said this plenty of times that i i believe this is by design with the, you know the way the 24 hour news circle ha cycle has emerged and how it's contorted over the years and now what it is just constantly feeding you 
crap over and over and over again to keep you off balance at all times. And once you get, once people get excited enough or interested enough in a story, it's like, boop, oh, here's another one for you. And, you know, because of that, people have just gotten this attention span. That's why, like, I think when Twitter finally went up to 280 characters, I guess, a couple of months ago, there wasn't as a big a fanfare as you would expect because so many people had gotten used to the 140 limit. I'm one of them. I stayed off Twitter for a long time because I, because like I said earlier in the show, I'm very, I write and talk the same way, very verbosely. <laughs> so Twitter, I just never thought was going to work for me, but I trained myself to be able to write in that mindset. And then it became harder for me to come back out of that, unfortunately. Same thing with memes. I had to train myself because my early memes, I was actually very proud of because I was getting a lot of information in there, but I was realizing they weren't getting a lot of traction because there was basically too many words. And that's really what it came down to. Like we did a show years ago with my friend, Johnny Liberty, who uh, does a, runs a bunch of Facebook pages and stuff like that. And he used to, I don't know if he still does, but at least he used to write for the Free Thought Project. But he's like, a, I call him one of the, like, my, my, meme, my meme godfather because he's basically the one who took me under his wing originally and showed me all the programs to use and helped me out and was like, basically, would uh, I would just send him, like I would send him uh, my memes before I put them out there. You know, once I made some, I'd send it to him, basically get his approval first. <laughs> and if he thought it was good, I was like, all right, this is good. It's going out there. Um, but that was kind of the thing that, that he showed me. It was like, you know, these things can be used and they, you know, you just, you have to, you, unfortunately, even if you have a great message and even if you're like the way you put it out there makes complete sense to you. Most people, unfortunately, have have these ridiculously short attention spans. So you got to make it like as punchy as possible and pare it down to the least amount of words to still get the message across, uh, you know, all these different things. And it was like, and I resisted it for a while. And then finally I realized, all right, I, maybe he's right. And of course, as soon as I tried it, like, there, you know, you saw the, the way all of a sudden there was a shift, like these things were getting liked and shared a lot more. And it's like, crap, I didn't want to admit he was right, but he's right. People have such these hard, and again, that, you know, you were mentioned that before about your book. I think that's, again, that's why I, I agree with you. I think the style you made your first book, you know, the meme, the meme book is great because people do have these short attention spans. So what do you do? You put a meme on one page and a little commentary on the other. And then as you, I, I was listening to your, one of the shows you put out recently, the, I guess it was the interview you did back in January with Mark Clare on Lions of Liberty, talking about all this stuff. And you're, you're talking about interpretations and people interpretative, interpretative differently. I always laugh at that when people come at me with that. It's like, okay, I made the meme. You're going to argue with me about the interpretation of it. It's like, <laughs> if the rest well, of you want to argue about it, go right ahead. That's fine. <laughs> but don't argue with me about the interpretation because I made the fucking thing, man. <laughs> I, I made a meme that um, the Liberty Memes page actually put out at the beginning of March. And for a while there, it was their most popular post. And I, I made this meme like six or seven months ago. And I threw it out on Twitter. And I don't even, I think it was one of those things I threw out right before I went to bed. And then I woke up and I just forgot about it. I didn't look at my notifications. I was just like, screw it. And I never went back and checked it again. Then all of a sudden, like six months later, it shows up on Liberty memes and people are absolutely going fucking nuts. And they're all these people are saying it's the most racist meme they ever saw. And I'm like, I, I made what? it. I, I'm like, how, what, how the fuck is this? And, and all the people who got it, we're, we're, we're just like, what's wrong with you people? Obviously, the person who made this is really disturbed and dark and, and you know, has a re has a really fucked up sense of humor. And I'm going, wow, these people do, do these people know me? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, Stop looking into my soul, man. <laughs> yeah, don't, do, don't do this. <laughs> but um, yeah, it, that, that was really weird. It was like it had over like, I mean, the last time I looked at it, had like 2000 likes and all these you know, like a thousand retweets. And I'm like, that's like a one-off meme I threw out there before I went to bed one night, you know, and forgot about. And then all of a, <laughs> then all of a sudden someone threw it out. And then all of a sudden it's like, whoever made this is right. Whoever made this is, is really racist. And I'm like, what? <laughs> Wait, that, that's, that, that, that's about my darkness. You know, <laughs> that, that's about the fucked up shit I have inside of me. And it's just so funny to see all the rest of the fucked up people be like, 
oh man, this is the greatest thing ever. And like tagging their friends. This is totally, <laughs> this, this is totally us. And then, and then other people are thinking that it's, it, it's total. It's, it's a, uh, a racist statement. And I'm just, it's like, just, it's just the way people, the way people interpret different things. I mean, I don't do philosophical, um, you know, and, and this meme wasn't political at all. It was just philosophical. And, you know, I mean, just pure, you know, meaning a life kind of thing, which I don't really do very often. Most, you know, I try to keep mine, um, keep my memes either um, concentrating on liberty or the culture. But and this had this had absolutely nothing to do with it. And it just absolutely blew up. And it was so funny to see how many how many people were interpreting it completely different. So yeah, that's, <laughs> that's, uh, that's fun stuff. But, you know, you know I. Making memes is making memes are not is not easy. Um, mostly because of what you said, you know, you have to keep it brief. The the worst thing you could ever do is you know post up post up a meme and then the first comment is TLDR. And it's just like oh crap. Yep. <laughs> I, I fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, like I said, I was I was there for a while at the beginning of my meme making because I just I refused to listen to everybody because I would get in just enough likes and shares that I was like, oh look, I'm just starting out, so this is these are good numbers, it's fine. But it was basically like you know my my good friends and other people that wanted to support me, I would basically just click like on anything I put out. Yeah. I wasn't <laughs> taking that into account at the time. But, yeah, they're just patting you on the head and yeah. like, good, good, good boy. Exactly. <laughs> you know, and so, but, and then I would look around and, and, you know, again, now a couple of years later, looking back, I'm like, oh yeah, now I see it. Cause when I read memes, I'm like, if I have to, if it takes me, you know, longer than 15 seconds to get through it, <laughs> there's too many words. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, oh, okay, now I get it. Now I see what everybody was complaining about all those years. You know, it makes sense now. But yeah, it's, you know, it's, it, you're right. It's not easy though. It's, it's, you know, I mean, it, I'm sure, is it technically easy to make a meme? Sure. Anybody can get a program and throw a meme together. Is it, is it easy to make one that will go far? No, it's not, you know, it takes a lot of work, you know, and like I said, at least I know from my experiences, the majority of mine that have gone anywhere close to viral, I don't think I've still, I don't still don't think I have anything that has uh, reached over a hundred thousand yet. So in shares or something. So I, I, yeah. I, I count that as viral. You know, I've had a couple ones that are like 20,000 or something, it was, which is great for me. It was amazing. But those, almost every one of those were the like the one-off ones you're talking about, where it was just I threw it together and, or I was actually getting in on the tail end of the social commentary that everybody else was currently making memes about. And I was just like, oh, all of these have been done before. Let me just throw my, you know, piece of crap into the ring anyway, just so we have something for today. And that would be the one that would take off. <laughs> And it's like, and then I would look at another one that I had actually taken like, you know, maybe an hour to put together for like searching for the, just the right picture to pairing the words down to just the, the, the right amount and getting like actually putting some work into and looking at it afterwards and going, damn, man, this is one of my best ones. And like, even some of my friends, like actually say, not just you know, patting me on the head, actually going, holy shit, man, this is one of the best ones you've ever done though. And those ones go nowhere. And I'm like. Fuck. <laughs> yeah. yeah but, been, you know, people are fickle. There. <laughs> what are you going to do? Um, but on that note, I know we're getting close to time, so we should probably get wrapping up. Uh, so first of all, thank you so much for coming on again, man. This has been really great. Uh, I really appreciate the conversation. And of course, before we get going, any closing remarks that you have and plug away anything you would like to plug. And I will, of course, throw it all in the show notes as well. Well, I just thank you. Uh, where where are you on the island? Do you mind saying on Long on Long Island? Uh, yeah. I'm I'm actually in the uh, Nassau County in uh, Levittown, uh, America's oh, okay. America's first suburb. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. I just wonder. Um, well, I mean, I I really appreciate you having me on. I I've been doing. You know, when, when I started out podcasting, it was just me talking to myself, and it took me to like get to like 18 episodes before I actually had somebody on. And then after that, I just pretty much fell in love with it. But, you know, I've still done a lot of solos because some weeks you just can't get people to come on. But um, and which is another reason why anyone who anyone who wants to talk, I'm, you know, I want to talk to them. So thank you for having me on. Um, I just want to plug my book, Freedom Through Memedom. If you go to Amazon and you search Mance Raider, it's the first thing that comes up. It's available for Kindle. You can download it in a couple seconds. If you have Kindle Unlimited like I do, you can download it for free. So um, 
you know, that's, that's pretty cool. The, um, my podcast is really my pride and joy right now. I've, I'm really happy with the, the, uh, the Scott Horton episode that I released yesterday was episode 95. And I would say starting 20 episodes ago is the direction that I've wanted my podcast to go with just my solo episodes or when it's just me talking, I, I, you know, I feel really confident about what, what I'm doing. Um, I think the subjects are important. I, I try not to comment on anything that is just, you know, I, I, I want it to be something that everybody feels, you know, that affects everyone. The guests I've had on, I mean, I've had everyone from Scott Horton. I've had Mises, Mises, Univ- uh, Mises Institute president, Jeff Deist on. I had Zoltan Istvan, the, the transhumanist on. So, you know, and, you know, I love talking to all of them, you know, that we, we talk about Liberty, we have that in common. So, you know, my podcast is my pride and joy. Check it out. If you go to any one of the podcast channels, iTunes, Stitcher, Google play, I have, I put my stuff up in the Spanish podcast channel because I have a bunch of people in Spain that listen to me. Uh, that's eVooks. Um, if you have an app like podcast addict and you just type in my name, it'll, you know, it'll pop up. You can search Man's Raider or Free Man Beyond the Wall. Um, I've, you know, all of it I put up on YouTube as well. I've started actually putting my podcast on um, libertarianinstitute.org, which is Scott Horton and Sheldon Richmond's site. Whenever I have a podcast, I put up put it up in the blog section there. So, you know, if you don't want to use a podcast, you know, if you don't want to go to YouTube or you don't want to, you can go, you can support Scott Horton by... Uh, you know, by, by putting some clicks on his website and that's, you know, I have a new book coming out. Um, I'm not, I, I haven't told anybody the title yet and I'm not going to do it until like, <laughs> right. I'm not going to do it until like right when it's ready to come out. Well, a couple of people know what the title is just because I have someone writing the forward for me. So obviously I had, uh, you know, I had to give them the title and then I had somebody, somebody else that I asked to write a blurb for the back cover. So a few people know the title, but, um, I'm not going to, that's going to be like the very last thing because, um, I don't know if the title is going to be provocative, but I think the title is going to be like, all right, what the, you know, what, what the fuck is this? <laughs> yeah. What, 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 what the fuck is this really? Nice. <laughs> um, but, um, yeah, that should be out. I'll, I'll tell you, I'll be honest. Um, it, if I have my way, it could be out by Monday. Wow. But yeah, but, um, it may delay, I may delay that. So, you know, I mean, if you throw, like I said, if you throw a man's Raider into the, into Amazon, um, you'll see it's the first thing that comes up, the book that I have out now. And, um, you know, obviously the next book will be up there too, but I'll be counting that down on Twitter and on Facebook. If you follow me on Twitter, it's, uh, Mance Raider at M N Rothbard uh, on on Facebook. Just look for look for Mance Raider and uh, should be able to see see my ugly face as the same picture from Twitter. <laughs> and uh, just send me a friend request, and I accept I accept friend requests from everybody because you never know who you never know who you're going to talk to and who you're going to affect. So um, yeah, that's and that's about it. You know, check out the podcast. Tell me what you think. Listen to the, if you've never listened to my podcast, listen to the last episode with Scott Horton talking about Oklahoma City. I mean, that's, uh, that'll, that'll give you a good introduction into, you know, what I try to do and the kind of attitude and the approach that I have to, to podcasting and, uh, check me out on Twitter and, you know, throw me, I, I don't, you don't even have to follow me in order to, uh, be able to send me a direct message. I have it open so that anyone can send me a direct message, say hi. Um, if you want to follow me, that's fine. You know, that's fine. We'll, you'll have some, you'll have some fun. You'll see a lot of memes and, uh, a lot of the people who follow me on Twitter have, you know, feel like friends now and some of their commentary, some of their commentary is better than mine. So, you know, <laughs> check it out. It's a lot of fun, but, um, just, you know, thank you. You know, I've, I honestly say this, and I, I can't remember who I heard say this about, about a year and a half ago when I was thinking about starting podcasting, and I've only been podcasting for about nine months now, but I want to see everyone starting a podcast because 
even if you only have 10 or 15 people listening in the beginning, at least you have, at least you're making a difference, 10 or 15 people. And if you're going to start a podcast, get up to seven or eight episodes. As long as you concentrate on getting up to seven or eight episodes, you will want to keep going. Yeah. If you if you get to seven or eight episodes and you decide you don't want to do it anymore, it's probably a pretty good idea. It's probably a pretty good idea that um, you know maybe this isn't going to work for you. But as soon as I got to like seven or eight episodes, I was like, yeah, I know, I know, this is what I want to do, and I wish I could do it every friggin' day, but you know, <laughs> I just you know, I don't have I, I don't have the time in order to do it. So I try to put out two a week, and some sometimes th- if I'm lucky, I get some, sometimes I get to put out three. So. But um, contribute in any way you can. Just constantly talk about liberty to people and you know, see where they're coming from and see how you can uh, see how you can relate to them. See how you can become see how you can become friends and influence them. Yes. Excellent, excellent advice. Uh, well, yes, I, I will quickly echo what uh, man said. Definitely uh, check out his podcast. Uh, like I said earlier, I, I subscribed recently and I've listened like the last six or seven or so, and they've all been great. And the last one with Scott Horton, really, really great. So highly encourage people to listen to that one. Uh, once again, thank you, man. So this has been great. Thank you, everybody, for listening. This has been the Seeds of Liberty podcast. As always, all of our content can be found at solpodcast.org. And Patreon still up and running. Uh, thank you once again for all of our patrons. Our numbers are starting to climb again. Uh, new episodes out once a week. And we are getting ever closer to our goal of $100, which will put us up to twice a week. So uh, please consider going over there and checking us out as we've added a bunch of new levels um, with uh, extra perks involved. So anyway, once again, thank you, everybody. And we will catch you next time. Peace. This is Daryl W. Perry, host of Free Talk Live. This November, I'll be running in the world's biggest and most popular marathon, the New York City Marathon, and I've accepted a spot on Team Innocence Project because I'm a passionate supporter of their work. Since 1989, 353 people in the United States have been exonerated by DNA testing, including 38 who pled guilty to crimes they did not commit and 20 of whom served time on death row. The Innocence Project provided direct representation or critical assistance in 180 of these cases. With your help, the Innocence Project can help even more people who have been wrongly convicted. As part of Team Innocence Project, I am raising awareness about wrongful convictions and raising funds to help free the innocent. I've already paid the race registration fees. However, to secure my spot on Team Innocence Project in the New York City Marathon, I need to raise $3,500 by November 1st. You can support the Innocence Project and help me secure my race entry by going to run.freetalklive.com.